Hi, it's Matt. Welcome back to the shop. And I'm trying to beat the light because it does like it did in the last week, uh, yesterday's videos. It gets stupid glare and what have you. So we'll see how this comes out. Oh, I might have to do this again. Any road, let's talk about Wankel engines. Yay! So out of all my all the engines I'm going to do in the alternative engine series, the Wankel engine is actually pretty much the only one, or one of the only ones, that has made it to mass production in its whole full glory. So I am not going to start going on about the geometry. Uh, I've prepared for that for one, but let's just say it's having one circle of a different ratio, rotating around another circle, drawing out that line and blah blah blah, and uh, uh, sciatroids or whatever the bloody call I can't remember now. Um, but basically the actual um, housing is a really weird shape and so is the actual rotor itself. So, apart from actually looking at the geometry of how the whole thing works, let's just talk about the Wankel engine as a whole. So, the Wankel engine is kind of a blend between a two-stroke engine and something completely different in its own right. Um, so let's talk about the pros of the Wankel engine. The Wankel engine gets rid of almost completely the reciprocating masses that exist with a piston driven engine. So the piston going up and down, up and down, as I said before about engine fundamental failures, is if you thrust a piston, you use inertial energy to literally get it up to speed, and then you stop it and that energy is completely lost. And then you have to repeat the process uh, twice every stroke, and it's just, yeah, accelerating, then de-accelerating, and it's all just a mess, it's a waste of energy. Where the Wankel is a constant rotating um, rotor, it has a rotation, however it does have a wobble, it's eccentric, it has a wobble to this rotation and because of that you do get some kind of, um, some, kind of uh, some thrusting elements around the centre because of that. So it's not completely obliterated reciprocating masses, it's not entirely reciprocating, it's a weird oscillation but it is a throwing of weight around a mass if you want to think about it that way. Um, but this constant rotation malarkey means that a lot of energy is kept in the rotor, so it's really good. You know, it's awesome because that it's got very few parts-ish, uh, very few major components. So obviously you've got rid of rods and you've got rid of this and you've got rid of that. Um, the crankshafts are very stout, they are very wide, very thick, very stiff, so they're very good at high speeds and there's not that much flex in and all the rest of it. The other thing is, is that for one housing, uh, I don't know, you can't really compare that to a cylinder, but you have three combustion chambers that are on each side of the rotor. So that also seems like an excellent bonus. It does mean that the engines are quite compact. Lightweight, nah, not so much, not really compared to a, a similar four-stroke engine. The weight really isn't the thing, it's more the compactness and uh, it's incredible appetite for going at high RPM because um, there's no reciprocating masses that you have to really piss around with. You can really go to high RPM and really get the thing screaming. Now let's talk about the cons. Well, everyone kind of understands that these bastards, because they are like a four-stroke system, that they chew oil like it's going out of fashion. Um, the seals, Mazda have had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time on manufacturing, um, perfecting, the housing construction, the row to the machining is very expensive, the way they actually plate the inside of the housing is very expensive, um, and like I say, all the rings and what have you, again, it's a very expensive process, they don't seal that well, uh, the friction losses meh, are higher than you would say for a piston ring in a four stroke piston engine. So yeah, there are pros and cons, one of the biggest failures with this engine is the actual combustion process itself. So you have a part of your weird housing shape and then you have a spark plug, combustion happens, you get flame propagation and one of the problems is, is with a piston engine, you have a piston, a piston and a cylinder, yeah, we get all that and a head and then when you've got your spark plug, when you get your little spark, the pressure increase is against all of the surface areas of the entire cylinder, and it's against this piston. However, 
The beautiful thing about piston engines is the pressure that's being applied is perpendicular to the surface. So if you want to push something, if you want to push, I don't know, a log or whatever, or a rock, you try and get perpendicular. So your surface is like this, and your force is being applied perpendicular, which is at 90 degrees, which means that all your force is being transferred directly to the centre of mass of that object. That's what you try and do. If you push on the top of something, so just say you've got a big boulder, you want to push here where the centre of mass is. That's where the most efficient way of pushing is perpendicular to the surface through the centre of mass. If you push on here, or let's just say it's a big lumpy bugger, and you push here, what you are doing is you are pushing at an angle that isn't 90 degrees, and not only that is because it's off the centre of mass, you are causing a torque, a rotation. Which, if you want to roll a boulder down a hill, that's great. If you want to push something, you don't. And with our piston, we want to push because it's the conrod and the crankshaft that turn that linear motion into rotational motion. So in a sense, a piston is a very good force absorber because its surface and the pressure acting upon it is perpendicular. With the wankle, this is where the problem comes is comes in is because the pressure is being applied here but we really want the rotor to go this way so again we are not perpendicular to solve this Mazda made a combustion chamber like this so at least you had some of the pressure pushing in the direction you actually want to go but that's where Wankel's fall a bit short on the um, extracting energy from combustion not only that is, as the whole thing is rotating, um, this combustion shape, the chamber shape, changes in uh, the volumetric shape, changes in a weird way. It's, it's not like a piston where it's well understood. With the piston engine, you have a cylinder here, and then when later on, a couple of milliseconds later, all that's happened is, is your cylinder volume has increased as you force down the piston. So it's pretty easy to calculate understand and design around where with this uh, you get into all these funky geometries and stuff like that so apart from the fact that yes the oil and it burns oil and it's oiling and the friction and all the other problems that people are well aware of one of the problems with a uh, wankel engine is how it applies this force to the rotor. Now you might think, well this is good surely because we're applying it like the boulder to cause a spin. It is, but like I say, you kind of glance, it's like a glancing blow against the rotor instead of actually forcing against the rotor. Now obviously we don't want, there is forces that do this and we don't want them because all you're doing is trying to shift your, you know, your crankshaft out of the way. You do want a rotation and that's what a rotary um, engine or a wankel engine is designed to do. It is designed to be a constant rotation system. What you would ideally want is if you could make the rotor, actually, do you know what? I'll draw it again because it's getting a bit busy. Um, what you do want, or what you could do, is um, you could make a rotary engine where you have your rotor like this and you have your seals in the corner. But what you would love to do is have scallops out like this. And, but the problem is, is when you have a combustion chamber that's like this, uh, you're still applying a lot of, there's a lot of surface area here, because you've got to remember, pressure is about surface area, where you could have a lot of force applied there, like so. But maybe probably one of the problems with this is that then you've opened up your volume, so your, com your compression ratio is really shoddy and crap. Even if you had a smooth housing, like that which you can't because of the shape of the housing which is kind of like some weird little oval like that's like a figure of eight, a soft figure of eight uh, it wouldn't work so well and it might yeah it cause other problems and again your compression your compression ratio wouldn't be that high so that's why I've decided not to do that but this would be great if you could apply a force to here and which is perpendicular which is perpendicular to your torque so you want to go this way that would be absolutely excellent, that would be really efficient. But because of the geometry and all the rest of it and the way the rest of the cycle works, you unfortunately can't do that. Or if you did, you'd lower your combustion 
your compression ratio and your combustion volume would be so much lower that you wouldn't have the benefit of doing this. So that's um, basically the main failure of the Wankel was that the oil is the main failure. The fact that it's extremely expensive to manufacture, the fact that it does go through oil and it's not very good um, for the environment and the pandas and the hippies and what have you. And the other thing is is the reliability of the parts because it is so difficult. You can't knock Mazda for trying, that's the thing. Um, they've stuck with it and they've tried to make it work and it does an okay, it does an okay job, you know. Um, so to finish off this video, I'm going to leave you with a little clip of the 787B, which was the Le Mans four rotor engine. And I do want to talk a bit about this car in the future because it has something very interesting that we don't generally see on the engine. Actually, nothing to do with the Wankel, actually to do with the manifold and what have you. Any road, I'll leave you with that and I'll see you in a bit.